good evening. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, Noah Khan called me several months ago and told me he'd like me to talk about the foreign exchange market. And I said, uh, how do you know it's going to be relevant then? And I don't know how he did it, but it's incredibly relevant today. So thank you very much. <laughs> but uh, I've been doing a lot of traveling lately, and I just came back from uh, Tokyo. And in Tokyo, uh, what I have to do is entertain clients sometimes. And sometimes what I do, you have to just do whatever the client wants. And the clients that I was with uh, before I came back to the U.S. wanted to go to the horse racing tracks. And I'm a currency strategist, I'm a horse races. And so I, I was just quietly observing things for the first several races. And then in the seventh race, it was like God spoke to me. Seventh race in the seventh post position was a horse called Lucky Seven. <laughs> Going off at seven to one odds. So I bet 7,777 yen. Came in seventh place. And I tell that because I think that it's, it's very much true about the foreign exchange market. As soon as you see a pattern, it's too late. So think about what's happened this past, uh, past few days. The, uh, uh, one of the, what people tell me is the most, one of the most beautiful women in the world, a uh, supermodel from Brazil, says she no longer wants to get paid in dollars, she wants to get paid in euros. Yeah. Jimmy Rogers, who is a, uh, once an advisor to George Soros, says he is selling all of his dollars, moving to China. Mm. To me, this tells me that this, this pattern is just about over. And that's what I'd like to tell you tonight, is tell you about why, even though the dollar is falling now, and it fell today to uh, the euro made record highs, we haven't seen this level in uh, the British pound since uh, the last time we had a uh, Republican in the White House who gave a fire sale on U.S. assets, 1981. But I'm going to tell you that the, well, I'm going to conclude tonight, and I, I, I kind of, I, I know everybody's had a long day, and I, I can imagine that when you hear an economist is going to talk, your eyes kind of, kind of glaze over. And I, I agree with many of you that you can take all the economists in the world and lay them end to end, and you still won't have enough to reach a conclusion. <laughs> and what I'd like to do is just uh, tell you the conclusion and then tell you how I get there. My conclusion is the dollar's decline is not very significant. It sounds big. People on Wall Street will make money or lose money. But for most of us in the United States, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to corporate America either. The dollar's decline is not the end of America's commercial empire or the role of the dollar in the, in the markets or the role of the dollar as the world's premier currency. I want to tell you that the dollar's decline does not affect corporate America. Corporate America is, I want to tell you about how corporate America really expands and competes in the world economy. So let me begin by uh, telling what you already know. Many people believe that the driving force that's, that's weighing on the dollar is that the U.S. has a large trade deficit. Broadly conceived, a current account deficit. It means the U.S. imports more than we export. This has been the true for basically since the end of World War II. And many people think that uh, we had a global overreach type of problem. The U.S. buys more from the world than it sells. People who ought not to have bought homes, bought homes. The government has a deficit. We're military overreach. This is the end of the U.S. Slow decline, perhaps like a lot of these op-ed pieces like the old Roman Empire. I want to suggest to you that it's not true and that what's going to happen is the dollar is going to recover probably early next year. So look at the trade deficit. The government tells us that when more, they're looking at goods moving across national borders, national frontiers. But when you look at a trade deficit and you get your hands dirty and really dig into the data, here's what's going on. A company like General Motors makes a braking system, say, up in Ontario, Canada, exports it back to GM's headquarters in Detroit. The U.S. government tells me that's a trade deficit. Over half of the U.S. trade deficit can be accounted for by the movement of goods within the same company. This is what globalization means. We have virtual companies, big factory, GM, and a man-made border, the 49th parallel, weaves in and out of this virtual factory floor. And as they move goods from one side of that factory floor to the other side, the US government says that's a trade deficit. I think that's robbing Peter to pay Paul. The movement of goods within the same company, half the US trade deficit is not really a deficit. Follow me? This is an important thing because what it means is if GM moves those goods from Canada to the U.S., there doesn't have to be a corresponding capital flow. The second thing I'd say about the U.S. trade deficit, another reason it's misunderstood, is because people, I think, do not really fully understand how the U.S. companies compete in the world. 
in Donald Rumsfeld's words, the old European answer is exporting. It hasn't been true since I've been born. That is to say, while the U.S. is going to be the world's biggest exporter this year, that is to say, the U.S. will export something like a trillion dollars worth of goods. That is not primarily the way U.S. companies service foreign markets. U.S. companies have developed, I would say, an evolutionary strategy that's based on building locally, selling locally. This is, again, what globalization means. It's sort of like uh, the weather. Everybody talks about it, but nobody does anything about it. Same thing with the trade deficit. People talk about it, but they don't really understand it. U.S. companies produce and sell this year about $4 trillion worth of goods overseas compared, toward, compared to $1 trillion of exports. U.S. companies compete in the world economy by having diversified their places of production and distribution. They have naturally, have a natural hedge, I should say, by having diverse production in various currency units. This is a very important way the U.S. competes. In the U.S., since the early 60s, since the government began tracking this data, the sales by U.S. affiliates is greater than U.S. exports. Second, uh, the next point I'd say is that uh, this is true not only for the United States, by the way, but Japan in the late 90s also made that crossover. So that their local sales are greater than their exports. Think about Japanese autos. Back in the early 1980s when we had that free trade Republican president, he put down this quota system on Japan called voluntary export restrictions, under which Japan would be limited, voluntarily of course, to 2 million units exporting to the U.S. Last year, Japan exported another 2 million units. But we, they sold a lot more, as Detroit and Ohio and North Carolina know very well. They're building in the United States and selling more cars and using the U.S. as an export platform. <coughs> cars made, like in Honda, are being exported from California back to Japan. Japanese companies have adopted the same evolutionary strategy that corporate America has adopted to compete in a world characterized by not just floating currencies, because of course when the United States says floating currencies, we really are saying what many people are hearing is volatile currencies. The question is, if, we only, if we're going to have many currencies in the world and they're going to be, they're going to be uh, floating more or less against each other, how to compete in that kind of environment? How can businesses plan? Japanese companies are beginning to follow the same general model as U.S. companies. Build locally and sell locally. That's one level of analysis, why the trade deficit is not as big of a problem as it may appear to be by listening to the, our folks in Washington, and especially those who are up for election. Another point I'd say is think about the uh, U.S., the historic role of the United States. I would suggest to you that in the 18th and uh, 19th centuries, the U.S. acted as a safety valve for the world's excess population. My family came over in the late 1880s from, uh, depending on what time period, from Eastern Europe or from Russia. The U.S. acted the safety valve for the world's excess population. Think about who built the railroads. Think about our own families. They came, a country of immigrants. We were the world's safety valve to get rid of these radicals and rabble-rousers from other countries that came to the United States for freedom. Then sometime after World War II, the U.S. became a safety valve for the world's excess production. Isn't that how Europe and Japan rebuilt after World War II? They had cheap currencies and the U.S. gave them favorable terms of trade. The U.S. bought their goods and that's how they rebuilt after the war. Sometime around 1980, through the uh, Reagan-Thatcher revolution in the capital markets, the U.S. became being a safety valve for the world's excess savings. Many people, when you read the newspapers and magazines, people say things like, the U.S. is borrowing money to buy other countries' goods. I think that uh, we, we sometimes, when we think about cause and effect, we've reversed a causal relationship. You know, the, uh, if you think about causation, you say, if A happens before B, you never get a B without an A. Whenever you have an A, you get a B. You say, well, A causes B. By that kind of understanding of cause and effect, increase in Christmas card sales cause Christmas. <laughs> right? Just not true. Right? What happens is that the world, especially the fast growing parts of the world in Asia, Latin America, Central and Eastern Europe, they have focused on the market for goods and they have underdeveloped their capital markets. They have a lot of savings, but they don't have a lot of financial assets in which to put those savings. 
They have little choice but to export their savings. I would suggest to you that countries lend us their money and then we buy their goods and invest back in those same countries. If you think about the U.S. as uh, we think about our own, uh, our own accounts, you have assets and liabilities. And you look at, by most calculations, the U.S. government, or the U.S. as a whole, is about two and a half trillion dollars in debt. That is to say, foreigners own two and a half trillion dollars more of U.S. assets than we own of theirs. So the U.S. is in debt, right? That's what it looks like. But when you break it down and get your hands dirty again in the data, here's what it looks like. On the U.S. liabilities, on, what, on our servicing our debt, we're paying about 3%. On our assets, we're getting about 4%. So even though we're net debtors of $2.5 trillion, as a banker, the banker in me tells me, if you're borrowing money at 3% and you're lending at 4%, you can do that all day. And if we just do it with the kind of money that I make or you might make, no big deal. But if you're doing it with the trillions of dollars involved in moving around the world economy, it adds up. <coughs> so in effect, even though we're two and a half trillion dollars in debt, it doesn't cost us any money to have that. It costs us no money to service that debt. Often, we're paid to do that. So where are we then? We've got a U.S. large trade deficit, <coughs> completely misunderstood. And I'm not the only one who says this. I had the uh, honor of, of working with some of... Uh, John Kerry's economic consultants. And I say this because, of course, if John Kerry would have won, I might not be here to talk about this. But uh, I am convinced that the next time that there's a Democrat in the White House, which could come sooner than later, that the next president will adopt an alternative measure of the U.S. current account that the government has already been working on and is available to the public. And on the Internet, you can, do it, you can find it by Googling, uh, is that such a word these days, Googling? A survey of current business. In the January issue for the last several years, the U.S. government has been reporting an ownership-based framework of the current account. It takes into account, if you will, the local sales uh, by affiliates. Instead of looking at movement across borders, it looks at ownership. And this isn't just like a parlor trick. I want to tell you that there's a good precedent for it. And again, we've got to go back to Ronald Reagan, which is around the time I began my career in the foreign exchange market. The U.S. was reporting the merchandise trade balance, which was always a deficit, it was a very large deficit, and then later, the U.S. government, would, by later I mean several hours, with a smaller fanfare around it, they would report the service trade. And the service trade in the U.S. is in surplus. One of, one of Ronald Reagan's brilliant ideas was to combine both reports into one release called the trade balance, which combines both merchandise and services. It made good politics because if you remember at the time you had uh, people like uh, Gephardt Smash, taking uh, sledgehammers to uh, Asian car imports. We had the rise of protectionism. Right? It also made good economics. Service trade is increasingly important, increasing share of world trade. Reporting them together showed a smaller overall trade deficit. Now this alternative measure of the current account would also show a smaller trade deficit. It doesn't get rid of it. It's not magical. But it does reduce it to levels that most economists regard as sustainable roughly 3 to 4% of GDP, rather than, say, 6 or 7% of GDP where we're headed. So if it's not the trade deficit, and by the way, this year is just a stellar year. Even though the U.S. consumer has pulled back, foreign demand has offset the pullback in the U.S. consumer. So, for example, for the first time since 91, exports made up a bigger share of Q2 and Q3 GDP than consumption. So the U.S. Is right now, exports is really helping us. We're, our exports in Q3 are rising at about 16.5% annualized rate. Imports are at 5.5%. So voila, while the dollar has been crashing, we've been having a smaller trade deficit. And as a percentage of GDP, it's been falling. So it's much worse last year than it is so far this year. The other thing people often blame is that what they call the twin deficits. Though to me, they're definitely, if they're twins, they're definitely not Siamese twins. Under Clinton, we had a budget surplus and a large current account deficit. Now we have a budget deficit and a current account deficit. But the, even the budget deficit, not thanks to cutting in spending or fiscal discipline, but primarily because corporate and household tax revenue, that household tax revenue, that's you and me, we've been, having greater, we've been paying the government more than they expected. So in the last fiscal year that just ended, the budget deficit was about $100 billion less than President Bush thought it was going to be in the beginning of the fiscal year. 
So if we've got the budget deficit falling, current account deficit falling and misunderstood, if you accept my arguments, then what's driving the dollar down? I want to suggest to you that it's nothing that we haven't seen before. And this is one of the key characteristics, I think, about capitalism that we often forget about. So sort of Vladimir Lenin and Karl Marx had it right. Uneven development. And what's happening, I'd suggest to you, is the U.S. is something between four and nine months ahead of other economies in the big business cycle. The Federal Reserve began easing in August, and since the Federal Reserve has begun easing, the dollar has accelerated its decline. Right now, as, as odd as this may seem, people have to pay for the privilege of being long dollars because U.S. interest rates are below other countries. You're sacrificing those higher interest rates to buy the U.S. dollar, a low-yielding currency. The currencies the dollar has done best against this year are other low-yielding currencies like the Japanese yen and the Swiss franc. High-yielding currencies like the British pound, almost 211 today. <coughs> I was in Britain a couple weeks ago and I, I admit I paid 11 pounds to go see a movie. Okay, it was a good movie, but not 11 pounds worth. <laughs> right, that's that's a, roughly a, a little bit more than $22 at the million dollar rate, and I don't get that million dollar rate. I've got to pay the same rate you pay, the tourist rate. Right, so I, pay, I probably paid close to $25 to go see a movie in the UK. Uh, it was good, but not that good. So, uh, so the dollar has been doing better against low yielding currencies, doing worse against high yielding currencies. And now the dollar is becoming among the lowest yielding currencies. And not just now, but we would project that the Federal Reserve probably has room to cut another 50 to 75 basis points before they're done. So we would be looking for, in fact, uh, even though a majority of primary dealers, those, those banks that have to deal with the Federal Reserve on a daily basis, the majority of them until about a week ago said the Federal Reserve was not going to cut rates in December. But they're coming around. And I think that uh, by the end of this week, we'll be, we, that is, uh, people like myself who think the Fed's going to cut again in December, are going to be part of the majority again. So those are great things. I mean, sometimes in our lives, we're just permanent minorities. But in the market, you can go from minority to majority in a couple of days. So I, I want to suggest to you that what's going on now with the dollar, it's a cyclical, cyclical factors having to do with the business cycle, having to do with interest rates, are the main driving force. If the Federal Reserve if it wasn't for the subprime and the crisis in the financial markets right now, and you were to tell me that in Q2 this year and Q3 this year, the U.S. economy, the fastest in the G7, above trend growth, that is what trend means for economists, is that level of growth that can be sustainable without inflation, or without rising inflation. The U.S. economy in Q2 and Q3 grew above trend growth. And if it wasn't for the financial problems we're having in the, in the banking sector, I would suggest to you the Federal Reserve would be raising interest rates now, but they can't afford to. <coughs> because of the credit crunch, in effect, the market has tightened for the bank, for the Federal Reserve. Interest rates in the, the, that the market sets, especially the short-term interest rates, are above what the Federal Reserve wants. And the only way to get them down, to take out that tightening the market's given, is by cutting the Fed funds rate further. We think that's going to happen. We don't think that the dollar is going to really bottom that is, I should say, the Federal Reserve is not going to get done probably until the end of Q1, maybe early Q2 next year. But other countries are not that far behind us. By early next year, we would expect the British, uh, which, by the way, the ECB, the European Central Bank, and the Bank of England meet tomorrow. There's two chances that the ECB cuts rates, slim and none. The Bank of England is a different story. There's a better chance that the Bank of England, who sort of pr has in the past has taken pride and surprises the market, there's a, uh, I would su sort of subjectively suggest to you that there's maybe a one in three chance that the Bank of England cuts rates tomorrow. Not the most likely scenario, but still not something to completely dismiss. But even if they don't cut tomorrow, we think that the economic cycle in Europe is turning. They're losing momentum. What, what we're going to grow, you know, here in the fourth quarter, uh, many of us expect the economy to grow. The consensus, say the uh, Bloomberg consensus, is about 1.8%. Most countries in Europe would be happy to have 1.8%, and that's during a slowdown for the U.S. Japan, economy contracted in Q2 this year. They'll probably do a little bit better. They report their uh, Q3 GDP in a couple of days. They'll probably do better in Q3, but the Japanese economy, they're lucky if they go 2% for a sustained period of time. So we think what's going to happen is that now that everybody and their favorite models have gotten short the U.S. dollar, 
we think that the, the party's almost up. Remember those, uh, that, that clock of the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists during the Cold War and showed like five minutes to midnight? Well, that's what we sort of suggest now. If you think about the dollar bear market, how much longer do we have to go? How much do we have to suffer before we can go to Europe again on tourists? <laughs> right? Well, we suggest that we've probably got maybe two, three, four months left. We think the euro is probably going to go to 150. We, and which, when, I first, when we first came up with that forecast, it seemed like uh, we were at like just getting above 140. And here we are, 147 today. And so 150 is not completely like ridiculous. And uh, I, we were thinking that the British pound goes up to 210, which as I said, we're, we're through that today. Um, so a, what happens is, and I think many of us, including people in the market, don't fully appreciate the way capitalism works. It's not like a smooth pond. Right? It, it, it's more like a tumultuous ocean where you, uh, where you, you overshoot. And overshooting is part of the game. It's part of what happens in markets. Think about the subprime. Something like uh, 3.2 million American households got subprime lending. Uh, Moody's.com, an affiliate of Moody's, the rating agency which might have lost some credibility. Uh, Moody's.com, so it's not really the Moody's, the rating agency, uh, but Moody's.com estimates that something like 1.7 million households are going to lose their homes from that subprime. That's a tragedy. But that means that 1.5 million are going to keep them. So I think that's really typical of the markets. Two steps forward, one step backward. And that's really what's going on now in the foreign exchange market. The dollar is going to get, is, there's different ways of thinking about value. When you buy a stock or you buy a bond, you know what you're buying. You're buying a claim on a future earning stream. When you buy a currency, valuation is much more elusive. In its pure form, currencies don't have a return. It's partly the confidence game. And so when you're buying the currency, you're not, it's not very clear what you're buying. And so while people might disagree on the exact model to use for equities, there's certain standard models that people can use and just change like the coefficient on the variables, if you will. <coughs> Currency market, there's only a couple models that people find use for. One is uh, called purchasing power parity. Right? You're probably familiar with the Big Mac, right? the basket of tradable goods. Uh, so the, the, the theory would say something like this, the currency should move to equalize a basket of tradable goods. And so the economist, uh, they say their newspaper, it looks to me like a magazine, but the, uh, they say that uh, the, they use the Big Mac as sort of the proxy. By that measure, fair value for the euro is closer to 117. But purchasing power parity implies that currencies ought to gravitate around the purchasing power parity level in the long run. So I, I ask myself, what other level currencies should gravitate around in the long run? Well, long run moving average. Easy to calculate. So if you look at a 10 or 15 year moving average of the euro, which of course hasn't been around that long, so use a synthetic version of it to take the Deutschmark. Uh, fair value, purchasing power parity to back into it, if you will, is closer to the 120s. Typically in the foreign exchange market, uh, two patterns, if you will, despite my seventh comment, two patterns. One is that currency markets can overshoot purchasing power parity by 20 to 30 percent before the cycle ends. We're approaching those levels now. The other thing about the currency markets is that for various reasons, the markets trend. And they trend for periods of, of long periods, five to seven years, maybe a little bit longer. The euro, despite what our, our supermodel thinks, somehow she just discovered that the euro has been rising and the dollar has been falling. But if truth be told, <laughs> the euro has been rising for seven years. In fact, it was uh, a little bit more than uh, seven years ago that the last time the U.S. intervened in the foreign exchange market, Lawrence Summers, who you'll recall was one of the architects with Robert Rubin of the strong dollar policy. After 95, both of those men authorized intervention in the foreign exchange market once. Rubin did in 98, selling dollars against the Japanese yen. And Lawrence Summers did, as I mentioned, seven years ago to support the euro at about 82 and a half cents. The euro has been rising for seven years. Don't think that just because a newspaper that finally discovered it, or our supermodel friends have, that that means that, they're, I, I want to suggest to you that they're not discovering the trend. They're Johnny-come-latelys. It reminds me, that I, was, I was telling someone before, before the meeting here tonight, that it reminds me of uh, back in the late 90s when you'd go into a cab in New York and you'd see the cab driver talking about the stock market and telling you which stocks to buy. This is a sign that the market is getting excessive. The fundamental change that we expect to fuel the snapping back of the dollar is that the Federal Reserve gets done tightening, excuse me, gets done cutting rates, 
Drew says, other central banks wake up and realize that the same forces that are weakening the U.S. economy are weakening their economies. They don't know that yet. Partly because the data hasn't been there yet sufficiently for them, and they're worried about the inflationary implications of high oil prices. <coughs> Excuse me, someone had asked me, I was talking to some media uh, yesterday, and they said to me, when is oil going to hit $100 a barrel? We were at like 98 and a half. I said, for all practical purposes, we're there already. What's the difference? Right? And so I, I want to say to you that it's the same kind of thing that uh, the, the dollar's move is, is very mature. We're in the final stages of it. And if I could tell you how I would see, how would we know when we enter the final stage? If you think about the, these things, if you buy my argument that we've really got, it's just a big business cycle. Last time we were at these sort of levels was in 1995 these kind of extreme levels for, say, the euro or for the Deutschmark at the time. If you buy this idea that's cyclical, the meat of the dollar's bear cycle is when interest rate differentials are moving against the U.S. like they're doing now and the dollar falls. The last stage of the dollar sell-off is characterized by interest rate differentials widening. Foreign investors as well as domestic investors say we need a greater interest rate premium if we're going to hold on to your assets. The dollar still falls during that period briefly. And then the dollar finds greater traction. So what I'm going to be watching for, not so much this year, and I'll explain why in a second, but really early next year for interest rate differentials to begin widening. Dollar to still fall a little bit. And then the dollar finds traction. So it's when the interest rate differentials begin widening in the U.S.'s favor, the dollar is still falling, is when I'm going to begin recommending buying dollars. Why don't I think it's going to bottom this year if we're so excessive in everything? Well, you've got to appreciate the way many people on Wall Street are compensated. First, recall that this year, despite this dollar being in a trend, and you think gold's been in a trend, all these markets have been trending. If you look at the performance of hedge funds in the currency markets, <coughs> miserable job. And these guys, by the way, get 2% for managing your money and 20% of the profits. And they've had a miserable year. Proprietary traders at banks. I, I should say that about, something about, about the proprietary traders at banks. If you really look at how banks make money in foreign exchange, they don't make money because people like me are outguessing the market. Frankly, we can't do it with any kind of regularity, anything that's meaningful. Banks make money in foreign exchange. I'll just use this one here. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, people make, banks make money in foreign exchange not because they're outguessing the market. They make it the old-fashioned way. Buy wholesale, sell retail. They also make money in the foreign exchange market because of something that Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel Prize winning economist teaching up at Columbia, what his, why he got the Nobel Prize was partly for asymmetries in information. If you know something about a stock, inside information, you better not trade on it. Otherwise, we'd have to visit you up in Sing Sing or something. But in the currency markets, there's private information that if our traders don't trade on it, they're not maximizing the opportunities of their position. And that private information is the customer flows, the customer orders. That is private information which retail people, like myself when I'm not at the bank, like yourself when you try to trade foreign exchange, you don't have that. You don't know where George Soros or the largest hedge funds in the world are buying their currencies. The banks know that. And they can use that information to help guide their own trading. That's how banks make money. But this year, banks have had a horrible ride of things. And it's very expensive to pick an end to a trend because you don't get it right the first time or the second time or necessarily the third time. It's very expensive to do. Many banks, many people at the banks, uh, have their bonuses at risk because of the poor performance they might have done personally and perhaps the challenge of the bank. So I'd suggest to you that people, are, people in the Wall Street and in High Street in London do not have the financial incentives to try to pick a top to this dollar. Excuse me, to pick a bottom to the dollar, pick a top to the euro, pick a top to sterling. They are going to do much better for themselves and for their institutions by riding with the trend. It's partly a function of like behavioral finance and thinking really about game theory, about how people are incentivized. It's very expensive to fight this trend. So people will take the trend and try to make back some of the money they lost earlier this year. So I would say if you're looking for a period of time that this is most reminiscent of, think about the end of 2004. Uh, then the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan, spoke about the current account deficit. And even though through all of his speeches, including his speech before the IMF and the World Bank uh, recently, uh, I believe that he fully, be fully agrees with my current account assessment. But the market misinterpreted what he said in November of 2004, uh, and the dollar fell very sharply. 
and everybody was giving the dollar the last rights, very much like they are today. And what happened? Early, early January of 05, when people came back from the New Year's party, the dollar took off. And it rallied for almost a year. It rallied basically for 10 months. I'm suggesting that next year is going to be, this, what we're going through now is very similar to that. That is, the dollar is going to overshoot now. Everybody's going to announce it's the, it's the death knell of the dollar, the death knell of America, and the dollar is going to come snapping back. So let me just say one other thing and, uh, about another issue that I know many, many of you are thinking about, and then we'll just have some Q&A. And this is about the sovereign wealth funds. You know, as central banks around the world, there's, uh, there's two, two sort of countries, two ways to think about countries. One set of countries, like OPEC countries, are selling commodities and getting dollars, and what are they doing with the dollars? Right? And the other issue is some countries, especially in East Asia, like China, intervene in the foreign exchange market and have amassed a lot of dollars. What are they going to do with it? So one of the things that these countries are doing with it is they're setting up a separate group called Sovereign Wealth Funds, that's sort of the generic name, who are going to manage this money more aggressively. And there's concerns in the market that the, and this is what really partly sparked the dollar's move earlier today. Uh, people are concerned that some countries like China or the Middle East will give up on the dollar and buy some other currencies. So far, the most author I should say the most authoritative source for how countries allocate their reserves by currency comes from the IMF and the Bank for International Settlements. So far, as of the end of September, there is no evidence that central banks are really diversifying away from dollars. For the last several years, the dollar's component of foreign reserves is roughly two-thirds, say 65 to say 68 percent. 25 percent of reserves are kept in euros. The others are sort of mixed between a, a, a whole host of currencies. If there has been a reserve diversification in the last few years, it has been out of the low-yielding Japanese yen and towards the British pound, which also tells you, especially if this is coming from Middle East money like we suspect it is, that the Middle East is not upset. They might be upset with U.S. foreign policy, but they're not taking it out on the dollar. Because if they were taking it out on the dollar, they'd have to take it out on the British pound as well, and they're not. So this talk about reserve diversification, it could happen. It's just not happening yet. To the extent that there's something going on, it's more of something like this. Say a central bank like Korea intervenes in the foreign exchange market to slow their currency's rise. When they intervene, they buy the U.S. dollar. So they say they say a $100 million transaction. Then it looks like a couple weeks later, that is with a small but measurable lag time, they then take those $100 million, they put 80 of them in the bank, and they sell $20 million or maybe $30 million and buy euros. Sometimes, not only in the markets, but sometimes in our lives, we have to think whether it's a zero-sum game or a non-zero-sum game. Currency reserves now are a non-zero-sum game. Central banks hold more dollars today than they did a year ago, which is more than they hold, held two years ago. It so happens that they hold more euros and more British pounds as well. So just to, uh, maybe uh, everybody can just, uh, I want to say, rest assured that the, uh, that the role of the dollar is safe. And I would give you two conditions on which it's going to change. One is if the U.S. loses its will. And regardless of who gets elected in November, I think that we have a strong defense of the U.S., regardless of who gets elected. And by defense, I don't want to get into the military debate, but just from an economic point of view and a point of view of global leadership. I would be, I think that if, if Treasury Secretary Paulson says tomorrow that the strong dollar is not really in our interest, but a weak dollar is, I'd say that's abandoning the U.S.'s role, abdicating. I'd say that would cause a collapse in the dollar. The other thing that could cause a shift out of the dollar and make me more concerned if there was a clear alternative. And despite uh, Jimmy Rogers uh, selling, his, uh, selling his dollars and moving to China, uh, which tells you really that homo economicus has no value for freedom of speech or elections or anything like that, that if there was a clear alternative to the dollar, that'd be a different story. But some people think the euro might be an alternative to the dollar. And I want to suggest to you that the European bond market, the euro bond market, is much more like the U.S. muni market. A lot of different issuers tend to be small issuers, different, fisc different tax schedules, very compli complex. It's not a unitary market like the U.S. Treasury market. So I leave you with that thought that uh, the dollar is going to come back and we're going to see brighter days again. We can go to Europe again, or Canada. <laughs> <laughs> So but please, uh, some, some questions? Please. Um, I think you do have to address the military. Um, how, 
how, uh, when and how will the true cost of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq come back to the U.S. economy? When you say the true cost, um, the only cost I can think of besides the human life and the sort of the uh, sort of the uh, unpopularity of the war, you think about the fiscal cost of it, and that's the um, amazing thing. I mean, think about this: Japan has had its longest economic expansion since the end of World War II, and they make the U.S. despite having a long economic recovery, long economic expansion, their budget deficit is six or se six to seven percent of GDP, depending on how you measure it. The U.S has a relatively small budget deficit as a percentage of GDP. So I think that the real cost of the war is not financial. It's not economic. I mean, think again, think about this. The U.S. economy, despite the war and despite how it's going, the U.S. economy has been a really, this could be the first year that possibly the Eurozone goes faster than the United States since 1990. The U.S. economy, the, the problem with the war, I think, the biggest objection, the biggest problem with the war is not economic. It's not about dollars and cents. But uh, I thought it was off budget, so how do we know what the number is? Yeah, that's part of the problem. We don't know fully what it is, but we have some sense, and we can tell from the U.S. debt levels and the treasuries that they're issuing. And this is part of the problem. Is central banks around the world, their reserves are growing faster than the net new issuance of treasuries and the net new issuances, new issuances of European bonds. So I think that, the, uh, that does the war make the U.S. stronger? I don't know. But it, I don't, my, my concern about the economy is not about the war's impact on the economy. It's about our impact on the economy. That is U.S. consumers and our friends in Washington. Just. Could you comment on the personal debt levels and also the, uh, the hedge fund uh, 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 bridge loans for these commercial property investments that are going into the billion? Yes. Uh, so two questions. One was, uh, I'm sorry, your first part of your question was the personal, debt personal debt levels. Yeah, you know, this is another thing. You know, here we are. We have paid for the U.S. American consumers. We have paid for not only World War II, but we've paid for a, a permanent military presence in more than 200 bases around the world. And people worry about the U.S. consumer not saving enough. I want to tell you that we really misfigure if. One of the implications, if, the U, if we're misunderstanding the U.S. trade deficit, part of the, if you think about the trade deficit, the current account deficit, as being a difference between investment and savings. If my current account assessment is right, that's not, it's mismeasured, and it's much exaggerated, then our savings rate is much higher. I'll give you an example. Last year, 2006, this is when the, the uh, housing market began weakening. Net worth of the household, net worth of American households, that counts the debt as well as their assets grew by about $3.5 trillion last year. Household net worth in the U.S., roughly $3.5 trillion to something like $57 trillion. That $3.5 trillion or so that we rose, our household net worth rose last year, is bigger than almost every economy in the world except for the United States and Japan. So I think that we misunderstand savings. For example, when you put, uh, say you have a, a, an IRA, you put $2,000 in it, stock market is up 10%. That 10%, now you've got $2,200. That $200 doesn't count as part of savings. The U.S. spends more money on education, higher education than any other country. I think, and I, I try to think about this for myself, my own education, your, your, your children's education, it's an investment. But that does not count as savings. So I would say that the, uh, this, of course, part of the issue is it's, it's very uh, improperly or very unequally distributed. But households in the U.S. are wealthier today than they were yesterday, than they were last year. And the real estate slide, which of course is important, but it's being offset by the rise in the stock market. And also Americans are big owners of fixed income, which is also offsetting some of the slide in housing prices. So I, so I think that... Uh, uh, we are seeing some signs of uh, tightening of credit conditions. The Federal Reserve does a study, a quarterly study, a survey of senior loan officers. Credit conditions are tightening, not just for uh, subprime, but for any kind of real estate, including commercial real estate. Uh, I saw a survey today that said that this is also spilling over to the UK. Half the people applying for credit cards in the UK are being rejected. Credit, credit conditions are tightening. If you're a net debtor, you're going to be squeezed a little bit. How long? Well, the Federal Reserve is cutting interest rates to help ease that. So far, it hasn't really affected consumer rates, but it looks like it should with one or two more cuts. As far as hedge funds and the, uh, the bridge loans, this is a problem. This is part of the paralysis in the capital markets. And this is an important thing in the U.S., and this is why the paralysis in the capital markets is so, uh, so sensitive. In the U.S., for every dollar that a corporation will borrow from a bank, 
It'll take two from the capital markets by issuing bonds and stocks. Europe and Japan are the exact opposite way around. And so uh, what it means is that we are more dependent on the capital markets. But the good thing right now is that corporate America is not investing that much. And to the extent that they are investing, they're doing it with internal funds generated by their nearly record profits. So I won't, sp I won't, uh, I won't shed any crocodile tears for the hedge funds. Uh, sort of like uh, what Ronald Reagan said about the budget deficit, big enough to take care of itself. <laughs> uh, uh, Please. What is the uh, relationship between uh, the, the declining dollar and inflation? Um, because I was reading somewhere where they were saying that European companies are, have lack pricing power where they're sacrificing uh, profit margin for market share. And secondly, what about the capital count of the, of the trade deficit? I was reading about how many European companies like Nestle, Deutsche Bank, Deutsche Telekom have been making massive acquisitions in the U.S. buying up American companies. You know, good question. This is one of, probably one of the concerns that the Federal Reserve has. In fact, they identified in their recent FOMC minutes. A falling dollar, people think, would cause inflation. But here again, I, I, I said to someone before, I, I'm a Cubs fan, and so I should, that, that should explain my source of optimism. <laughs> uh, but the, when you think about a good, say a, a widget comes from Europe. It sits on the New Jersey port. The price that we pay as consumers is 30 to 50% larger than the import price because of the cost of storing the good, transporting the good, and marketing the good. That 30, 30 to 50% is higher in the United States than any other country. Part of the importance of the marketing and the transportation, we're a big country. So uh, one thing I'd say is that the cost that we pay as consumers, there's a lot of little uh, like shock absorbers along the way. And that when you look at what countries are doing, and this is, gets back to my point about the US, being more, U.S. companies being more reliant on the capital markets. What this means is that a company, if they don't report good earnings, and GM reported disastrous earnings today that helped fuel this 300-point uh, decline in the stock market today. GM reported disappointing earnings. So what happens? Their cost of capital goes up. The cost, for them to get money, the price of it goes up. But if you are a German company, a continental European company, a Japanese company, you're more dependent on bank capital to get, your, to get as a source of capital. But those bankers tend to be very patient. The way that they compete, if a U.S. company gets an exchange rate shock, we're going to pass it on to the consumer. We've got to maintain profit margins. Continental European companies or Japanese companies, when they compete, access to bank capital, more patient, they are in there for the long run. They need to hold on to market share. So they do not pass on the cost to the consumer. Give me an example. The euro is up roughly 8% year to date. Import prices from Europe are up less than 1%. What does this mean? It means they're accepting narrow profit margins. How do they overcome that? Well, they do a couple things. And this is, I think, part of your, part of your answer, is they're going to source production more in the United States. They're going to locate production in the U.S., locate sourcing of materials in the U.S. This is how they're going to compete in the United States with a weak dollar. They're going to move production here or buy places in the United States. That's why I mentioned about this fire sale in the U.S. U.S. assets look very cheap now if you're in Britain. You haven't seen this level of the British pound in, since 81. So what is that, 26 years? So what we are telling British clients is use the, use the strength of your currency to buy foreign assets now because you might not see this level again for quite a long time. And so that's what we suspect will happen. And the, of course, the capital account is the mirror image of the current account. What my, my point was about the, uh, about the U.S., about the uh, cause and effect, was really that growing up, taking Econ 101, we're taught that the trade balance drives the capital account balance. But these days, listen to this, the foreign exchange market daily turnover, $3.2 trillion a day. $3.2 trillion a day. That's enough to cover world trade in a week. What, I'm sorry, what the world trades in a year, movement of goods and services across national borders in one year, we see in the foreign exchange market in a week. U.S. GDP is about $13 trillion. Uh, by, by this time tomorrow, we, we in the foreign exchange market would have seen the turnover to buy everything the U.S. produces in a year, just this week. Capital flows are so much bigger than the flow of goods and services. Uh, it's one of these stories where I think that the tail does not wag the dog. So again, I'm not, I'm not, I think that these things are, this is, the way that, this is the way things have to heal. Falling dollar forces countries and companies to, to buy U.S. assets, locate production in the U.S. And then the dollar begins recovering. Back there, please. 
Yes. Uh, how, how do you respond to the observation that uh, the bulk of this record household net worth is inflated home equity and that uh, some 80% of GDP is consumption of unproductive goods? Well, I hope not 80% of GDP is unproductive goods. My iPod's very productive. <laughs> but uh, I, I, think that the, uh, I think the point really is that two things. One is that I'm not sure that, that the U.S., that we're buying uh, unproductive goods. I mean, we're buying consumer goods, right? And, and these consumer goods, they don't generate an income stream, but they, they, they have something else, enjoyment, uh, use, use value. So I, I think that, and also I, I really think that this, uh, what are housing prices going to do? Your guess is as good as mine. It's always, you know, they say it's a local, local market. And so what does that mean? It means that real estate prices might fall 5 10%. But the key to U.S. consumption, as we've seen this year, is not the value of our homes. The key to U.S. consumption is not home equity. The key to U.S. consumption is income. And the key to income is jobs. And last Friday, the U.S. reported that the U.S. economy grew over 160,000 jobs. We are growing, that is to say, the Federal Reserve argues that we need about 100,000 jobs a year, excuse me, a month, to keep the unemployment rate relatively steady. Unemployment rates creeped up a little bit, but income growth remains strong, and that's the key to consumption. And for me, I'm, I'm not a Puritan. I like consumption. The problem is I would, I would share people's uh, concerns that consumption is not widely enough shared that the third world isn't just a faraway place. You can go about 10 miles north of here and have some of the same issues that you do in third world countries. High infant mortality rates, high unemployment, high levels of high school dropouts. South side Chicago where I grew up, the Hill District in Pittsburgh, the uh, East LA, the third world is right here and the income and consumption is not evenly distributed. But on an aggregate level, which is where our economists have to look at it, I would suggest to you that this year so far, at least through the first half, Household net worth is still going up. A slower rate, for sure, but still going up. If household net worth slips a little bit for one year, I'm not sure that's a major problem. But I think that we as a, we as a country have to be concerned that our children might not live as good as we do. That is to say that I'm the first one in my family to go to college, and that was always a weight for a rising in socioeconomic status. That might not be that way anymore. These days it seems you need a, you need a college degree just to hold even. And even, even that might not be enough. Uh, an, an MA or a master's degree or an MBA. Just to, and there's thousands of them out there, of course, these days. And you need something to, character, to distinguish yourself. And so I'm not sure that we're, gonna, we're resolving that problem yet. But I think that's the challenge, is how to maintain rising living standards for increasing numbers of people. But I'm not concerned that that's going to end, that this is, that is a structural issue. And I'm not sure that the, the wiggles of the dollar or the wiggles of the economy are influencing that in the short run. Per capita income in the U.S. continues to go up. Actually, that's a, uh, I have this, uh, let's see. Um, I, uh, maybe here's something to think about. This is why also why I'm optimistic. Per capita income in Mexico, what we think is a third world country, Mexico's per capita income in the year 2000, was higher than Britain in 1900. When Britain, of course, was, was great. Pax Britannia. When Britain was at the peak of its empire, its per capita income was lower than Mexico's was in the year 2000. And I suggest to you that, that's, that that pattern is generally true around the world. Since 1950, per capita income for the world has gone up about fivefold. This is an amazing thing. Growth might be interrupted by these periodic crises, which is the way capitalism works in fits and starts. But I don't think that the household net worth issue is really the, the, key, the key derailer of this, of this engine. Please, but back there. Yeah. I just want to reiterate that then a lot of the things that we hear, whether it's on CNBC or any of these other places, uh, is really what you're saying is somewhat bumpy. The, 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 the major the, the issue with respect to the falling dollar and, and everything else from your standpoint, it has to do with the, with the interest rates. And, and as they diverge more and more, let's say, between the euro and, and the United States, more higher or lower, it, that is the, it, that is the, the vortex, the major, the major dynamic to, to look at. Yes, the, the, and I, I would say that. I would say that you know, currencies is the price of money. Interest rates are the price of money. There's got to be some relationship. And my suggestion is that it's not a linear relationship, but more of a cyclical relationship. And where we are in the cycle is, neg is bad for the dollar, but that's because the Federal Reserve is pursuing pro-growth policies. In the short run, those pro-growth policies weigh on the dollar. 
in the longer run, intermediate term, it's going to be more positive for the U.S. But does that mean that central banks will trade and they'll sell short with, uh, as, as they see interest rate change? Central banks, I'd say central banks don't, uh, don't do that uh, for the most part. Uh, they do not uh, take leverage. They do not go short like that. I'd say that uh, President Bush is the first president of the United States uh, since the end of World War II who has not intervened in the foreign exchange market. And I'd be, I'd be shocked uh, if the Federal Reserve intervened in the foreign exchange market uh, during his presidency, uh, barring some kind of catastrophe, which, which the euro going to 150 is not the catastrophe. Well, if you, if you, if you, if you were, if Kerry had won, would you, would you have advised him? To if I was, excuse me? If Kerry had won and you were his advisor, would you have advised him to do the same thing? Yes, I would say that the, uh, uh, the foreign exchange market at $3.0 trillion a day, the U.S. has in reserves about $60 billion. Uh, it's just, it's like trying to like, uh, you got your boat that's sinking and you're trying to take it out, to unload that water with a spoonful at a time. Probably is not going to work for any long period of time. And while the Federal Reserve eases rates, you're fighting a major headwind. And so usually they want to intervene when fundamentals are working their way. I could see, I could see a better case that Europeans, especially our friends in France or Italy, might want to intervene before the U.S. does. But they also know intervening by themselves tends not to be a high probability of success experience. Please. Uh, to paraphrase you very poorly, you're basically saying the current account deficit is not major problem because there are some definitional issues in it. The government deficit is not a major problem because there's some definitional issues. Savings is not a major problem. It doesn't take into account housing. The issue I have is foreign exchange is a relative price. So if you make these adjustments in the U.S., fine, but you've got to make them overseas also. And comparing apples to apples, there might be problems here relative to overseas such that the dollar should have been weak for the last two years, such that these arguments are very nice dinner conversations, but at the end of the day, the market has spoken very loudly. Well, I, I, I think that the dollar should have been falling. The Federal Reserve has been cutting interest rates, and before they even began cutting interest rates, remember the Federal Reserve paused in raising interest rates last June. Since then, the ECB has been continuing to raise rates. Just last night, the Reserve Bank of Australia hiked rates, 25 basis points to 675. Where are Fed funds? Four and a half. So of course the dollar should be falling. This is part of the business cycle. So I'm not saying the dollar. I'm not saying the dollar is improperly to fall. I'm just saying that we're overshooting whatever measure of fair value one might have, purchasing power parity, any kind of measure the economists want to look at. The dollar is overshooting it, and that the the driving force is not these so-called structural issues. Because for me, one of the key structural issues was reported today: productivity in the U.S. rose by more than four and a half percent in Q3. That is a structural issue. That is what makes America great: productivity. Strong labor markets, and for me, that's really the key. You know, the uh, what makes America great economically, which other countries haven't been able to duplicate, is I'd say is not the flexibility of the labor market. Because what does that really mean? It means my boss can fire me whenever he wants. It means that my I don't have a defined pension program. They're going to give me some money in my 401k, and I got to manage it myself. That's what that's what the uh, uh, flexible labor markets mean. And I think what we have, what makes America great, is a flexible capital markets. Think about a guy. He drops out of college and goes to a bank and says, uh, Mr. Banker, uh, can you lend me some money? I want to build computers in my garage. And the bank, Brown Brothers or any bank, says, sorry, Michael Dell, we don't have money for you. Let's think about uh, David Bowie, right? Plays music. We think it's music. He's, uh, uh, he says, uh, I sell hundreds of million dollars worth of DVDs and CDs every year. Can you give me my money up front for the next few years? The banker, she laughs him out the door. Right? Now there's David Bowie asset-backed bonds that are backed by his future income stream. Same thing cities and municipalities are doing in the U.S., issuing bonds backed by toll income or parking meter income. This is what makes America great, and that flexibility of the capital markets is what, what encourages people to come to the United States. Entrepreneurs. Think about the, the uh, World Bank and the IMF, excuse me, the World Bank and the U.N. do this study of... Uh, called Doing Business, and they have new ones every year. And it, may, it does a time motion study, how long it takes to open a business, how long it takes to close a business, how easy is it to register property. The U.S. comes out, not on the top in all categories, but that flexibility, the things that businesses want, is in the United States. Entrepreneurs, they might have a strong euro, but the French entrepreneurs come to the U.S. like California and open up businesses because they can. And so, uh, for me, I, I, I know I must sound like an apologist. These things don't really matter. Just focus on interest rates. I'm not, I'm not trying to fight the market. I'm just saying that 
when the when the supermodel of Brazil says she's taking euros, that's just got a, that just begs for the contrarian us to say, hasn't this gone a little bit too far? <laughs> Please. There seems to be an inconsistency between, um, let's say, the Japanese building a plant here in order to uh, have a more efficient cost of production to meet local demand, etc. And on the other hand, denying the Chinese the uh, opportunity to bid for Unical. Yes, I agree. I think this is this is the problem. I think you, you hit on a very important topic, and which is if the, if people in other countries have a lot of the savings and we want to buy their stuff and invest in those countries, why shouldn't we let them invest in our country? And I think that uh, there's, uh, the, the, the episode with Unical was, I, I want to suggest to you, was a bit of an anomaly. And the thing with the ports, uh, with uh, uh, Dubai and the ports, I think that was a bit of an anomaly. I think that uh, both the Congress and the Treasury were a bit caught off guard. They weren't prepared for it. Uh, I, I, you know, the, uh, uh, one of the uh, Dubai, or, yeah, I believe it's Dubai, wants to buy part of the NASDAQ, the over-the-counter market. Now, they're only seeking uh, 5% voting rights. And so, t technically, because it's not, it's not going to change ownership or control of the company, it doesn't have to go through this new committee process. But they're going to send it through the committee progress process anyways. Uh, when I talk to U.S. Treasury officials, this is one of their most important concerns is to help have a process in which these things can be vetted, especially if a foreign government is involved. So I think that going forward, we're going to see a little bit clearer rules. That's what we need, right? Rule, rule of law. Have some rules that everybody knows what are, what's, the, what's the game plan. What are the, what are the rules of the game? And let's just play by those rules. And I think we're going to see that evolving. I think that that's, the, that's what people are afraid of. Not that the, I think when I talk to Treasury officials, they're not so concerned about the size of the deficit. They're concerned about the political backlash in terms of protectionism and the end of the open and flexible type of economy. So I think that what we'll see is we're going to see more Japanese, more Russian companies where countries have savings, a lot of savings, liquid wealth, they're going to move it to the U.S., parts of it to the U.S. and buying real assets. And if we don't want them to buy, if we don't want them to buy our real assets, we don't want them to uh, buy our paper assets, we might as well close up shop and follow Pat Buchanan and build a big fence around the whole country. <laughs> isn't that related to this issue of encouraging the foreign creditors to continue to invest in this country. If they can only get the bill rate as opposed to the return on an equity, right. uh, they'll be discouraged from doing so. Yes, I think, I think that's why uh, even though it tends foreign economic policy tends not to be a very salient issue in elections, but I think that below the surface this is one of the key issues that uh, that the next several years we're going to be having to wrestle with. Because large, I mean, there's huge levels of savings building up in these sovereign wealth funds, in OPEC countries, in China. Uh, Japan almost has a trillion dollars of reserves as well. What are they going to do with it? And do we want them to buy our goods and our companies and our country? And I think to some extent we do, because think about what happened with Rockefeller Center. The Japanese were very happy to buy Rockefeller Center. We bought it back from them a few years later for a song and a dance. Uh, they bought their Chrysler, uh, paid big money for Chrysler. We bought it back, or a hedge fund bought it back for a song and a dance. So I think that that's the great thing about letting ownership move where, where, people, where the market's lower to. Please. Mark, I want to change uh, the topic a bit. The, there's been a lot of uh, reporting in, in some of the press on Iran thinking of setting up an international petroleum exchange and, and denominating it in dollars. They've recently started to accept payment from Japan in yens versus dollars. And every now and then you hear this, this frightening uh, uh, scenario of oil being priced in, in euros versus, versus yes. dollars. Is it possible, uh, is it practical, is, is the ECB big enough to handle those kinds of flows, and does it matter? As I'd say that typically what we call this is like transactional demand for the currency. That countries need a currency to buy oil or to buy wheat or corn or anything, right? And so the transactional demand for dollars is relatively modest compared to the $3.000 trillion a day turnover. But I would suggest to you that that it is true, Iran and also our, uh, our neighbor in Venezuela is willing to accept euros for payment for their oil. At the end of the day, and I don't want to disparage any country, but I just say that those countries don't really matter in terms of world leadership. People are not following Chavez, they're not following Iran. If this was, for me, the key player in this, if the Saudis tomorrow say, okay, no more dollars, only euros, I say that would be a shock and that's worth a couple of cents on the dollar, take the dollar lower. But I don't see that really happening and I think uh, uh, Robert McKinnon, an important economist, uh, currency economist at uh, Stanford, argues that what we're talking about is the numerator, 
the single the currency that's the benchmark in the world. And it seems to me that these are one of the things that you have a natural monopoly for. Oops. Oops, out of time. <laughs> wow. Well, you see, this is what happens if you don't pay your bills. <laughs> right? Right? Someone turn off the lights, huh? But yeah, in, in general, I think that uh, so far, I'd say that no other country is following the Iranians, who are not really offering leadership, and the Venezuela. I think that if the Saudis were to change, that'd be a bigger deal. But so far, the Saudis, like the Japanese and the Chinese, are among the biggest defenders of the strong dollar policy. So I, I, I'll be watching for that, but I think that in general, the euro is, uh, there's just not enough euros in the world to make it worthwhile. And it'd be very complicated for businesses to be able to keep track of these currencies, not just oil, wheat, corn, soybeans. You know, this is the other amazing thing that we forget about. Something like 99% of U.S. exports are invoiced in dollars. That's understandable. But something like 93% of what the U.S. imports is invoiced in U.S. dollars. This is twice as high as with the Europe. Europe, at only about 60% of European exports are invoiced in euros. And only about like 50% of their imports are invoiced in euros. The dollar is the invoicing currency still of the world. Japan is, is even less. Japan is about 23% of their imports are invoiced in dollars, excuse me, in yen. And about 25% of their exports are invoiced in yen. They use the dollar too. Trade between two countries not involving the United States use the dollar as a reference currency. That has not changed, and it won't change because of this movement in the dollar. It's going to, it would change, again, two conditions. The U.S. loses its will. People think the U.S. really wants a weak dollar and is going to try to drive the dollar down intentionally. Or if there was a clear alternative. And I'd say the market is voting with their feet that there's really not a clear alternative. If you think about the euro, it's not really much bigger as a reserve asset or as an invoicing currency than the sum of its parts. The French franc, the German mark, and the ECU was at the time, before the advent of the euro, was about 20% of world reserves. Today, the euro is 